Before we get started with the episode today, there's something I want to talk about. The, the episode itself, once the theme song kicks in, this episode was recorded at least two weeks ago. This portion that you're listening to right now, however, was recorded Wednesday morning, January 22nd, the morning before this episode was released. And I just, just learned that Terry Jones from Monty Python passed away. Now, he hasn't been doing too well the last year or so. It came out that that he was suffering from dementia. And um, so we knew this was coming. Those of us who are, who are fans of Monty Python, we knew that this was coming. And I'm not quite sure what I want to say about it at this moment. I'm usually not really affected all that much when a celebrity passes away because... As much as, may, you know, maybe I might have grown up with certain celebrities always being a part of my life. It just never really affected me the way that I've, you know, I, I look at people around me. And, and for example, when Prince died, it really, it really affected my wife and it affected a lot of people. And intellectually, I, I got it. I understood. But I, it's just nothing like that has really kind of touched me the way it has touched other people. But the moment I saw that Terry Jones passed away, I don't know, I've just been sitting in my car in silence. He, Terry Jones, was not always one of my favorite members of Monty Python. For a long time, he was actually my least. When I was in high school, and, you know, you, you can't like a group, whether it's a band or a comedy troupe or whatever, you can't like a group without ranking the members. Right. You've got your favorite. You've got your least favorite. You've got the others in the group that are somewhere in between. And regardless of the fact that maybe somebody might be your least fe least favorite of the group, it doesn't mean that it's it's somebody you don't like. And for the longest time, Terry Jones was probably my least favorite of the group. Now, I couldn't tell you nowadays. I don't want to sit here and rank the guys. That's not my that's not my purpose here. But. As I grew older and started learning more about each of the guys from Monty Python and seeing some of the stuff that they did outside of the group when learning how Terry Jones was a, was a historian and a lot of the documentaries he's done, historical documentaries, and um, Eric the Viking was a was a movie that he wrote and directed and he just he quickly rose in the ranks and Michael Palin has always been my favorite but second to Michael Palin for probably the last 10 years has always been Terry Jones and it's not I guess I'm trying to put it into words somehow before I before we get into the to the episode itself but I just I just want to say that it's a great loss to the world he has given so much joy to the world and to my life so many times that I have felt down or depressed. And I've been able to uh, put on Monty Python. And it's made me, it's just, it's just made me feel better about the world. So he's going to be missed. I'm going to miss him. But we should all be as lucky as... Terry Jones. We should all, when it comes time for us to go, to know that you have created this body of work that's going to be remembered probably forever and remembered fondly. And so it is a, it's, it's a big loss to the world today, but he has put so much into the world. I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I just felt like I had to say something. All right, let's start the episode. The following podcast is going to contain spoilers, along with me, just a regular guy, talking about all the things I love, such as comics, movies, television, music, and books. So yeah, proceed at your own risk. Hello 
and welcome to another episode of Just Another Fanboy. I'm your host, and my name is Steven. Hey, folks. Yay. He says half-heartedly for no reason at all because my full heart is in this sucker. Because today we're talking about Manifest Destiny Volume 3, which has a subtitle, but I'm not even going to try. It's in some kind of Latin or something or other. One of these languages that your host, that would be me, doesn't speak. You ever notice whenever I start acting like I'm an idiot, I go hillbilly on you? Heck, it's in some kind of language that I just don't speak at all. I don't know why I do that. I guess I am creating some sort of correlation between that accent and brain capacity, which is, which is silly. It's a, it's, it's a stupid thing to do, which makes me, I guess, a stupid person. I can admit it. Not the smartest tool in the cabinet. Not the deepest bowl on the shelf. Not the yellowest banana in the tree. That would be me. Big Steve, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so before we get into this book, I do want to mention that I have previously talked about Volumes 1 and 2 on the podcast. Volume 1 was way back in episode number 19, and Volume 2 was in episode 67. The links to both of those episodes, or at least the the links to the web pages, will be in the show notes. So this was written by Chris Dingus, Pencils and Inks by Matthew Roberts, Additional Inks by Stefano Goidano and Tony Akins. Colors by Owen Gianni and letters by Pat Brousseau. Okay, so I'm really enjoying Manifest Destiny. This was a, I don't even remember how I came across this comic. I feel like I stumbled across it. I think I mentioned in, when I talked about volume two, that I, I was doing a search for Bigfoot comics and maybe stumbled across this book because I know It's either volume four or five. At least the title alludes to the fact that we're going to meet the elusive Sasquatch. But I don't know if that's 100% correct. I don't know if that's how I came across this book. I just, I just did somehow. They say that the downside when it comes to shopping online is that you don't get to go into a store and browse the shelves and stumble across some new discovery. And I think in most cases that is correct. And yet I feel that's how I stumbled across this book. It was online. I read all my comics digitally, but I wasn't actively seeking a comic book about the Lewis and Clark expedition featuring monsters, because that's what this book is. I wasn't actively seeking that out, and yet I stumbled across it somehow, and I gave it a chance. And I'm glad I have, because I really enjoy it. Volume 3, however, Volume 3 is a bit different than the first two volumes. They, They add a couple of elements into the story that, while it doesn't change the tone of the book, it doesn't really change a whole lot about the book. It made it a bit different. I guess there is a slight tone change just based on the quote-unquote monster we meet in this volume. So the first thing that they do is throughout volumes one and two, our narration boxes are from the journal of Meriwether Lewis about the expedition. And we still get that here in volume three, but twice maybe in the book, we also get journal entries from a Captain Lawrence Helm. And all right, so we've already touched upon my brain capacity just a little bit ago in this episode. I'm not a smart man. I'm not a stupid man, but I'm not a smart man. And I do have trouble keeping characters in my brain when you're dealing with a book that has multiple supporting roles, supporting characters. And I'm talking supporting characters that don't get a lot of 
Don't get a lot of screen time. Don't get a lot of page time. Because there are certain supporting characters in this book that I remember. Any each time, anytime I, I so far I've picked up a new volume, I remember certain characters from the previous volumes. But many, a lot of the soldiers, not all, not all of them, but there's a few soldiers here and there that, for example, this volume slightly focuses on one of the soldiers by the name of Collins, and we get a slight bit of his backstory. I don't remember if we met him at all in the first two volumes. No clue. And so this Captain Lawrence Helm, who we're getting a couple of journal entries from, I don't recall if he showed up in the book in the first two volumes either. And so when I open up volume three, and the first thing I get are these journal entries from him that speak to stuff that happened in volume one, I start scratching my head right away. And I'm worried that I haven't been paying attention. And I actually read volume three when I thought I was reading volume two. And now I'm reading volume two when I think I'm reading volume three. Now, of course, it wasn't too hard for me to find out that that was not the case. But for for a moment there, it really threw me right out of the story. Page one, panel one. I'm completely out of the story. I'm starting to freak out because I'm thinking that I just did episode 67 not that long ago in which I profess to talking about volume two and the whole time I'm talking about volume three. You look like an idiot and I don't need a lot of help in that department. But you know, As I said, that wasn't the case. But because of this inclusion in the book, that's what happened to me there on the first page. And yet I soldiered on. And I read volume three within a couple of days. And that that simple little fact there should be a testament to how much I'm enjoying these books. Because I don't have a lot of time to, I, I read, I do feel like I read quite a bit. A lot of it is while I'm sitting on the couch and we're watching something on Netflix or Hulu with the kids, and I just pick up my phone and I start reading comics. We did have a holiday not that long back, and I had a few days off because of that, and I read this book. But I have so many things to read that I tend to read them by issue. So I'll go to one trade and I'll read an issue, and then I'll go to the next trade and I'll read an issue, and I'll just rotate through my digital stack. Well, the one thing about Manifest Destiny, at least the uh, the trades, is that it's not readily apparent where each issue throughout the trade ends and the next issue begins. They, they put the trades together like they do the Walking Dead trades. There's no cover images between issues in the book. You just, it's, it's one big story. And that does kind of help. So I, I sat down and read it, and I just I just read through the whole thing. Um, Sagajawea is pregnant in this volume. I don't remember them mentioning. I f- there there's kind of a tugging of a memory that maybe in volume one they did mention that she was pregnant, but again, my memory isn't that great. And it was back in October, maybe that I read volume one. But she is, she's pregnant in this one and she catches the flu, which is never a good thing for a woman when she's pregnant. But then you take it back to the 1800s and you stick them out in the wild on a boat. That's, that's even worse. So she spends most of the issue on the boat, which she's not happy about. She doesn't want to be on the boat. She wants to be out there living with nature, fighting monsters and killing things. And we learn as she's having fever dreams that she has been trained from a little girl to fight these monsters or as her people call them, the demons. But that was kind of a fun little side story with Sagajawea because she's very, she's like a freaking Klingon, man. She does, she's, she's, I don't want to use the word savage. That's probably not a good word to use. But she's very, she's got that one track mind. She doesn't want to be part of this other world. She wants to be in her world. She doesn't want to, she just didn't want to be on the boat. She doesn't want to be around these people. There's also a part in the book where the soldiers are now starting to 
get very disgruntled about this quest, this journey, this exploration that they're on. The the group that's with Lewis and Clark are made up of soldiers and then convicts. They took a they took some folks out of jail who were going to die in jail and they said, "We're going to give you a second chance. You can live out in the wilds during this expedition and if you make it back, you're free to live the rest of your life outside of prison." So those guys have been rather disgruntled from the beginning. They've been they've been a bit of trouble from the beginning, but they're outnumbered by the soldiers. And the soldiers, of course, are following orders. So we haven't had to worry too much about the convicts because the soldiers have been there. But now the soldiers are starting to push back. And at one point, there is a near mutiny. And Lewis feels like he has to step in and show all the men that they're not going to take any crap from any of them, whether they're the soldiers or the convicts. And he tells them, okay, look, here's here's what we're going to do because I'm tired of this mutinous behavior. You pick one man and I'm going to fight him. And when I win, you get back to work. We go back to shore and we do what we're supposed to be doing. Because the kind of the crux of this issue is that there's a moment at the beginning where this this soldier Collins that actually he's one of the convicts. He's a young dude. He is with Captain Clark and he's got a telescope and they're they're looking out upon the land at, at, at where they're going and, and, and the world around them. And he sees off in the distance, he sees one of these arches. And Lewis and Clark decide, well, there's another arch. We have to go there. Because our job isn't just to explore this area, it's to clear it of monsters. And the two arches that we've come across so far have had monsters living near it. So we have to go to this arch and kill any monsters that might be there and take samples and and study and blah and all that stuff. Well, of course, the soldiers at this point are like, no. Every time we've run across an arch, people have died, and we don't want to be the next ones to die. And so Lewis says, okay, well, fight me, one of you. If you win, y'all can leave. You can do what you want to do. If I win, you're coming with us. And he wins, but he does cheat because just before the fight is about to start, the the, the soldiers and convicts pick their champion, and he's a, he's a big old buff dude, very rough and tumble. And Lewis removes his jacket. He's rolling up his sleeves. And he says, okay, before we get started, we should probably establish some rules. That's about as far as he gets when this guy punches him in the jaw. Which was kind of a nice scene because I almost felt like Lewis knew that that was going to happen. But he wanted to he wanted to be able to stand up in front of them and say, hey, I gave you a chance. I'm going to cheat my butt off in this fight. But I wanted to give you a chance to have some rules established. And as we saw, you were the ones that chose to go the route of no rules. And during the fight, he is getting his rear end handed to him. There's a mallet on the the deck of the ship. He's able to grab it and he beats the guy down with the mallet. So they go to explore this arch. The first arch was made out of plants. The second arch was underwater and seemed to be made of, well, plants, more of an algae-like substance. This arch is made out of clay, dirt and clay. And they do encounter a couple of monsters. And this is where, this is the second time in the book that I felt like there was a slight change. This this was an actual, for me, a, a change in the tone of the book. The first tonal change was adding this journal entry from this Captain Helm. And now they encounter this creature called a Fezron. And it looks like they describe it as a uh, a bear cub crossed with a bird. It's like this blue bird. <clears throat> it's hard to describe. Think of a think of a bear cub that walks upright, but instead of fur, it's got blue feathers. 
And instead of a, a bear head, it's got a, a bird's head. But the beak is full of sharp teeth. And it attacks one of the men. And it's, it's probably about three feet tall, maybe. Maybe two and a half, two feet tall. It attacks one of the men, bites, it, bites the dude on his arm. They end up, they're able to capture it and they throw it in a cage. And the guy's arm starts swelling up and they realize that the, this creature had poison in its mouth. It's, it's a venomous bite. But they keep the thing in a cage on the deck of the ship. And it looks not quite cartoony, but it almost looks like, you know, back in the day they would have these, they would have cartoons and there was always a, uh, a silly animal sidekick. You know, Thundercats had Snark or Snarf. That was his name. Snarf, Snarf. Dungeons and Dragons had that little unicorn, Uni. So on and so forth. That's what this made me think of because after it's on the ship for a couple days, it starts talking to them. And they're like, whoa, how do you speak English? And he's like, I know speak English. You speak Fezron. And you find out that his name is Dahog and he's a Fezron. And they kind of befriend it to a certain extent. And it ends up healing the man that it bites because it does say, yes, I did inject poison into his wounds, but I can heal him. And he heals him by peeing on his arm. We're assuming that's what it is. We don't see where the yellow liquid comes from, the yellow steaming liquid, but come on. And it heals him. I mean, like rapidly. And then one night, a giant bat creature, shadowy bat creature, takes a man from off the deck of the ship. The guy is is on watch and the shadowy bat creature comes and takes him away. And they learn from Dahog the Fezron that this was a creature called a, va- a, a, a Vameter, V-A-M-E, V-A-M-E-T-R, Vameter. There's only one of them and it's been plaguing his people for generations. So they load him up in his cage and they go to meet his people and they get there and they find out that their French tracker, Sagajoya's husband, Charbonneau, he is there. They have captured him and they're getting ready to eat him. He's alive. They're rubbing him down with like freaking butter and ketchup and stuff and they're going to eat him. And these things are like, yeah, we're going to eat them. And they're like, they're, we're, we're going to kill you. And they're, they're well, you're going to try and kill us, but there's a lot of us and, and we're going to kill you. So you learn that once a month or so, once a year, the Fezron offer up one of their own as a sacrifice to the Vameter. And it comes in and carries it off. The Vameter comes in and carries the Fezron off. And then the rest of them are safe. And Dahog was the Fezron that was to be offered up as a sacrifice. And since Lewis and Clark captured him, the thing took one of their men instead. And so in order to get Charbonneau back, they make a deal with the Fezron. They say, what if we go kill the Vameter? Will, you know, you you give us our man back. And they say, okay. Well, the Vameter is really weird because it's like a big bat creature, but it doesn't necessarily have a head. Whatever it kills... It takes their head and it uses it as its head. And they learn that it's highly possible that both the Fezron and the Vameter are aliens. This is where, really, it just took a weird turn for me tonally. You got this talking bird, bear, creature thing that's probably an alien and a big alien vampire bat-like thing. Don't get me wrong. I did enjoy the book. I'm still enjoying the series. But it felt like a strange, slight shift in tone. Not a huge one. They didn't have little green men in flying saucers. We don't know for sure that these things are aliens. And even if they are, we don't know how they came to Earth. They find these trees in which these the Fezron have recorded their history. And it says that they have come to this place from another place, but everything that would explain how they came here and where they came from is is missing. 
And I, I guess there was a there was a forest fire or something like that that destroyed those trees. And none of the Fezron alive remember. It's been so long ago. But they kill the Vameter, if I'm even pronouncing that right. I keep wanting to say in my mind, I read, I look at the word and I say Van Meter. And I know that's not right. But they kill it with the help of Collins. And now I don't remember if Collins survived or not. That's going to drive me crazy. I'm going to have to go back and look. But that was volume three. They're getting deeper into the wild. They're now encountering even more strange things. And then the next volume or the volume after that, they may possibly encounter Bigfoot. And I'm both excited and worried at the same time about that book because I have in my mind a certain expectation of what Big, Bigfoot should be. And now that we've met what might possibly be aliens in the book, talking owl birds, basically, owl bears. Is that what they're called from Dungeons and Dragons? Owl bears. Short little talking owl bears. Now that we've met them in this freaking book, who knows what they're going to do to Bigfoot? I can tell you what I would love to see, and that's a, a tribe of intelligent, Wookiee-like creatures, benevolent that will fight with savage violence to protect their home. But in the end, they are, more, they are smarter and more enlightened than us. That's what I'd love to see. But I don't think that's what we're going to see. I don't know what we're going to see. I have no idea. But I'm excited that we're going to get some Bigfoot. But I'm worried about how they're going to write Bigfoot. You know? You know what I'm saying? I think... I don't know. I think the proof comic by Alex Grecian has just ruined me on Bigfoot because in the end, that's what Bigfoot was, a creature that is more intelligent and more enlightened than us. And he carried a gun, which is pretty awesome. Actually, I don't know if John Proofrock did carry a gun now that I mention it. He may have. I don't quite recall. Anyway, as always, the art is phenomenal in this book. The art style is something that is just right up my street. I dig it like a bowl of chili with some onions in it, maybe some shredded cheese, possibly a little sour cream, a couple of saltines. You know what I'm saying? And I was really excited to learn. I've been looking at uh, new issues that come out each week to see if maybe I want to buy one. I can't buy a lot of new stuff. But if there's something new that's starting, you know, a new image series that I kind of want to get in on or, you know, just a new series starting or a mini series that I want to get in on, you know, maybe I'll pick it up. But I was really excited to find the other week that there was a new issue of Manifest Destiny out. I blew my mind. They're still making this book. I can't remember when the first trade came out. I think it was 2017. And to know that they're still making the comic... I just can't imagine where this story is going to go. If they're still making the book, I just can't imagine where the story is going to go. I'm picturing something pretty epic in my head, and I hope I'm not disappointed. Are you reading Manifest Destiny? Am I the only one? Don't spoil it for me, but let me know what you think of the book. Are you caught up? Is there some epic stuff happening? Let me know. Feedback at Stephen or else. Dot com. Until then, until your next episode, my name is Steven and I'm just another fanboy. Be nice to each other. I'm out. Peace. Uh, I can't believe I said peace. Just Another Fanboy is a presentation of the Stephen or Else podcast. Questions and comments can be directed to feedback at stephenorelse.com. You can support the show for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Stephen R. Orr and get instant access to the My Other Podcast podcast, a weekly show about whatever crawls its way into my tiny little mind just moments before I tap record. You can find me on the World Wide Web at stephenorelse.com or find me on Twitter and Instagram by searching for at Stephen or Else. I also encourage you to subscribe to the show, leave us a five-star review, and share this episode with a friend. Just Another Fanboy is a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. You can find that over at comicspodcasts.com. All links will be in the show notes. Bye-bye, Daddy.
Good job. Ooh.